Okay, here we are, um, our lesson on elders, deacons, preachers, saints. This is lesson number five in the series, and the uh, title of this particular lesson is The Work of an Elder. Uh, this is another uh, lesson, we've had several, um, on the elder portion of the series, referring to elders and deacons and preachers and saints. We will be moving on to other roles as, uh, as we go through the uh, series. Well, so far uh, we have said some very specific things about elders uh, in the church. First of all, we've said that they exercise the, leader, uh, the leadership of Christ uh, in human form in the local church. Also went uh, through the idea that uh, they are men. Um, they were men uh, in the first century and we continue to select men to provide the spiritual leadership in the church according to the Bible. And thirdly, they have both general and specific qualities and qualifications found throughout the New Testament and concentrated especially, uh, these uh, qualifications, uh, specific ones anyways, are uh, concentrated um, in two particular passages, one in 1 Timothy chapter three and the other one in the epistle uh, to Titus chapter one. I also said that when measuring themselves against these qualifications, because there, there's a long list of qualifications in these passages, and when a man is comparing himself to these, a couple of things that uh, he has to remember about these qualifications. One, they are eternal in nature, meaning that it's the same qualifications that are required generation after generation, they're eternal in nature, but they are not impossible to achieve. They are very human qualities attainable by normal people. God is not looking for superman, super perfect people to serve. Uh, he lays out a list of qualifications in His word that a normal hu a human being can aspire to. Another thing we said about the qualifications is that they are subjective in nature and we should determine if a man possesses these qualifications and qualities um, to a positive degree. In other words, to a degree where that particular quality or qualification is visible or recognizable in him. Again, uh, a, a man doesn't have to have the quality uh, to a perfect degree, uh, but to a recognizable degree. So if we want to, someone in a leadership position, an elder who is, for example, who is hospitable. You know, it says uh, elders should be hospitable. Well, just how hospitable should they be? What's perfect? You know, uh, should they have people over every night? Should they run a homeless shelter? You know, how, how hospitable do they have to be? And the answer is, well, hospitable to the point where that quality is recognizable in them by other people. And then the third thing we said is that these qualifications are also a blueprint for the kind of man we want and also the kind of Christian the elder himself wants to become as he grows in Christ. So it's, a, it's really a blueprint for growth, uh, a, a, a roadmap, if you wish, a spiritual roadmap map that uh, helps us understand you know, the various levels of development in the spiritual character. Okay, so today we're going to look at the work of the elder in the local assembly. Looked at the character, characteristics of the uh, elder, qualifications, now we're going to look at the work. Uh, so I have to kind of give a little preamble here to make sense, to put things into context. First of all, we in the churches of Christ, we hold to the idea that the Bible teaches us in specific ways. In other words, we believe that the Bible teaches us using various tools, one of which is a direct command. In other words, how does the Bible teach me things? Well, it gives me commands uh, that I should obey, things that I should do. In addition to this, it also provides examples of how things are done. How did the apostles do a certain thing? How did the early church do a certain thing? Uh, according to the inspired word. And so the Bible teaches us by providing direct commands, by providing a variety of examples, and also uh, through, necessary, uh, through necessary inference. And I'll explain what necessary inference means uh, in a moment. So 
uh, when we want to find out what the Bible says about something in particular, well, what we do is we examine the Bible to see what it commands about that particular thing or that particular attitude. We try to see if there are any examples of this thing being done or being said or this attitude being displayed. We look for examples and we also see if there are any conclusions or suggestions that are implied by words or situations or actions that can guide us. Uh, that's the necessary inference part that I was talking about before. So if we understand this idea of the Bible teaching us through commands, examples, necessary inference or conclusions that we can come to based on evidence that we see in the scripture, if, if we remember that, then when determining the work of an elder, this is a good system to use because all the information about this subject is not located in one particular place. It'd be nice you know, uh, if the Bible, we think, I, I believe the Bible's laid out the way it should be, I mean, according to God's direction. But my human mind sometimes thinks it would be so much easier if all the information about elders, everything about them, who they should be, what they should do, what their job is, all that business, was all in one place, in one chapter, one big long chapter, it'd just be easy to find. But that's not how it works. That's not how the Bible is uh, laid out. So uh, in order to find information about what the work of the elder is, I, I go through the New Testament. I, I go through the New Testament portion that talks about elders, um, a New Testament portion of the Bible, and I'm looking for direct commands that talk about of the work of the elder. I'm looking for examples of elders at work. I'm looking for necessary inferences that draw certain conclusions about the tasks that elders do. So uh, having explained that, let's take a look and see if there are some direct commands. And I begin with direct commands. Now a direct command concerning elders and their work. Well, there are two places in the New Testament where the apostles are giving direct commands and instructions to elders about their particular role. One of them is in Acts chapter 20, verse 28 to 35. And in this passage, Paul, the apostle, is giving a charge, if you wish, giving instructions to elders who have come to visit him from the church and the churches in Ephesus. And so we read in chapter 20, verse 28 to 31. Paul says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So what are the instructions that Paul uh, uh, is giving here? What, what is he saying to these elders at Ephesus? What must they do? Well, first of all, he says they need to guard the flock and they need to guard themselves. You see, the way to attack the flock, the flock is just a euphemism, if you wish, for the, for the church, uh, an image, if you wish, for the church. The way to attack the church is to attack the shepherd of the church, the shepherds of the church. You know, the way to attack the flock is if you attack the shepherd, you've got the whole flock to yourself, right? So this is why Paul begins by saying that uh, no accusation should be received against an elder except in front of two or three witnesses in 1 Timothy 5.19. Now I say that because one way to divide the church, one way to harm the church is by making some sort of false accusations against the elders, against the shepherds. That's one typical type of attack that takes place. So in another passage, Paul is saying, you know, if you are going to attack, if you're going to accuse elders, make sure that you have the evidence, make sure you've got several witnesses and so on. And so there's a way to do that. All right. 
So in Acts chapter 20, going back there, Paul uses imagery or the imagery of a shepherd who both feeds and leads and also protects the flock. So what, what is their work? What is the nature of their work? Well, to feed the flock, to lead the flock, to protect the flock. In other words, to guard against false teaching and teachers whose purpose is to gather disciples after themselves. You know, there are some people, you know, they're happy if they can have influence over one or two people. They don't want to lead, they just enjoy you know, exercising power over a certain group of people and sometimes over a certain group of people in the church. So being alert means to watch the teaching and to watch the teachers that they both are pure and sound and sincere. So one of their first tasks is to guard themselves, of course, and to guard the flock against false teachers and false teachings. So let's keep reading. He says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Sanctify. So in verse 32 he says, stay close to, stay aligned with the word of His grace. You know, I commend you to God and the word of His grace. Stay close to the word. And how do you stay close to the word? Well, you know, personal study, uh, exercising the gift of teaching. You know, in any Bible class, the teacher is the most blessed because he has to do the study, he has to dig into the word to be able to teach it. So he's really blessed uh, by his study. And so Paul is saying, stay close to the word. Stay close to the word in study and in reflection and in exercising um, your, uh, your gift. He goes on to say, verse 33, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so here Paul is not talking about teaching, now he's talking about an example. He said, be an example of hard work of a person who is an encourager, someone who is generous, someone who provides leadership. So you know, he's, he's, he's referring back to himself and saying that he showed them how to lead by these methods and now they must teach others to lead, uh, to lead by these type of methods as well. So Paul says that the main work of the elders in this passage are really threefold. First, protect against false teaching and false teachers. Secondly, promote sound teaching. Help the church to grow in the knowledge of God's word. And thirdly, provide an example of leadership. And the way that we provide an example of leadership, of course, is by demonstrating you know, the skills, the spiritual skills and the spiritual fruit that comes from walking after the Spirit of, uh, of God. All right, there's another place in the Bible where there are some direct commands, if you wish, direct instructions to elders, and that is in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. So here, <clears throat> excuse me, Peter says, therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So Peter, um, he repeats Paul's charge of providing leadership, but he gives some insight as to what should uh, be the motivating factors of this type of leadership. So he says, lead according to God's will and God's Word. Make sure that the leadership you provide, the direction that you're choosing, is based clearly on God's Word. He says also to lead voluntarily, eagerly, not have to be pushed 
You know, we, we, we mentioned in the qualifications, if you have to talk somebody into being an elder, if you have to twist their arm or tell them all the wonderful things that'll happen if they become an elder, that person isn't ready to be an elder because the very first thing that that person should have is at least a desire to serve. Okay? So Peter is simply repeating this idea. They, they should lead voluntarily, eagerly, to come into God's service in this role. And also he says lead with eagerness, but not eagerness to get personal gain. Personal gain in receiving honor or receiving kudos from different people, but rather eager to serve the people in the church. And then he also repeats the idea that an elder should lead through example and not through the exercise of power. You know, the type of leadership that doesn't say, uh, you got to do this and you do that, can you do this? Hey, I'm a, you know, I'm a leader here, so you need to listen to me. That's, that's a, on the shop floor, that's at the office, that's at the university, that's in the field, you know, the boss, you do this, you do that. In the church, that, that's, not how it, that's not how it works. The leadership that Peter is talking about is the leadership that says, let me show you the way. Let me show you how this is done. Let me give you an example of how I'd like for this to be done. That's the type of leadership, through example. And then in verse four he says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So interesting that uh, Peter refers to the reward for elders, a crown of glory. The Old Testament refers to this particular crown as the Lord Himself in Isaiah chapter 28, verse five. Now in the New Testament, there are many different crowns that are, that are promised. For example, you have incorruptible crowns in 1 Corinthians 9, 25. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Crown of life, James 1 and 2 the crown of 12 stars in Revelation 12, 1, and the golden crown in Revelation 14, 14. The golden crown is the crown that Jesus wears. Now, I'm not sure you know, if all of these crowns refer to the same thing, just the different ways of saying the same thing, or maybe they really are very separate things. But I do know that the term crown of glory is only used in connection with elders. And so you know uh, if the Lord gives it, you know, if the Lord is going to give the crown of glory, you know certainly that it will be, it will be worth it. So let's keep reading uh, Peter in chapter uh, 5, verse 5a. He says, and you younger men likewise be subject to your elders. So now he's not just talking about elders, he's talking about individuals in the congregation and how they ought to respond to these elders. You know, a final admonition to the younger men to be humble and to express that humility through obedience to the elders. You know, young men tend to be headstrong in every generation, right? Nothing new. And Peter teaches how they should respond to the elders if they want to please the Lord. So Peter repeats and he expands on the idea that the work of elders is to lead, to lead by teaching, and to lead by enthusiastic example. All right, so remember we said, how does the Bible teach us? First of all, it gives us direct commands. So in these two passages here, in Acts 20 with Paul and in 1 Peter with Peter, you have the apostles giving direct instructions, commands, do this, do that, this is what you must do, this is what you must strive for, and so on and so forth. The second way the Bible teaches us is through example. Now Peter and Paul are the only two that speak directly with instructions to elders. They're the only two that give specific instructions. However, the New Testament has passages where elders are seen doing their work, and so we can use these passages to define more clearly the New Testament pattern for the work of the elder. In other words, we have commands, if you wish, Paul and Peter, but we also have examples in the New Testament demonstrating uh, elders actually doing their work. For example, um, you have, uh, for example, in Acts eleven twenty nine, 29, an example of the 
elders overseeing the collection of funds for the church, for the, uh, for the needs uh, of, the, uh, of the church. You also see that in concert with the apostles, the elders decided how to resolve a particular dispute over the issue of circumcision of Gentiles in Acts chapter 15 too. Uh, the church at Antioch was a mixed church, a lot of Gentiles there, an early church with Gentiles in it. And uh, some teachers came from Jerusalem and they began to teach that you couldn't really become a Christian, like if you were a Gentile, you couldn't really become a Christian unless you first became a Jew in the sense that you, you did the things to become acceptable as a Jew. You were circumcised, you offer sacrifice, but in addition to that they would add food laws and all the other things that Jews uh, uh, were uh, imposed upon by the, by the law. So this was, a, this was a, an early test of unity in the church and the young church at Antioch, they couldn't figure out what the answer was and so they you know, referred back to the apostles who were in Jerusalem. But it's very interesting that in Acts chapter 15 it says that the apostles and the elders of that congregation got together to talk about this uh, situation. And so you know, there was an argument over how the gospel was to be applied to the Gentiles. And they figured out an answer. They, they, they came to a conclusion, they wrote a letter, they sent it to the church at Antioch, giving them the details on how to resolve this particular issue. So all this to say that part of the work of elders, an example that we see, is that they're decision makers. They make decisions, they help work out issues and problems in the church. You can't have a church of three, four hundred people trying to do things and serve and projects and so on and so forth without having some conflict, without needing decision makers to decide how we're going to do things. And the elders are in that role. Um, they also advised Paul on how to resolve a dispute with Jewish Christians over his work with Gentiles in Acts chapter 21 verse 18. So we see an example of elders guiding an experienced minister, an experienced evangelist, missionary, apostles on how to uh, uh, resolve certain problems in his ministry. They also, we see, uh, uh, appointed preachers to their ministry. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 14, Paul talks about uh, Timothy the evangelist being you know, commended into ministry by the laying on of the hands of the elders. And we still do that today. I, that, that's what happened to me when I became a minister, when I was appointed, when I was installed as an evangelist, uh, you know, working for the church. The church, through prayer and the laying on of hands, commended me. Well, that is also a task of the elders, to commend, to appoint to various roles uh, in the church. In addition to this, we see examples of them teaching because Paul says that this is one of their qualifications and later it says that they should be honored if they work hard at this particular task. 1 Timothy 3 uh, verse 2, 5 verse 17. Yes, teaching is the, pri uh, the, the, the main way, if you wish, that elders exercise their leadership. And then uh, examples of elders uh, providing comfort and, 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 and uh, support for those who are ill and those who are weak spiritually. James chapter 5 verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Call for the elders, it says, and they'll pray over you. So that's, we, we get an example of the type of things that elders were doing. So the picture that emerges from all the examples we have uh, in the New Testament is that it is a group of men who teach, who encourage and oversee the good works of the church, who help resolve issues that threaten the unity of the church, especially when related to the application and the understanding of God's word. Sometimes we understand God's word and so on and so forth, but we're having you know, trouble applying the word in real life situations. And, and that's where we're, we're looking to elders, leaders, to help us understand how to apply God's word in everyday life. And of course, uh, to provide uh, counseling and support for those who are weak physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and then uh, certainly to appoint, to develop and appoint and guide the work of, 
uh, preachers and, and, and missionaries and deacons and so on and so forth. So last week I gave you the requirements of the job. This week we're seeing uh, the job itself and what it entails. All right, so the Bible teaches us one, by giving us direct commands, two, uh, by providing examples, and then three, another way that it teaches us by necessary inference, uh, necessary inference. Well, a necessary inference is a conclusion that is required by a set of facts or examples, but may not necessarily be stated. All right, so let me explain. The apostles, for example, had received John's baptism, right? All of them, all 12 apostles, they had all been baptized uh, into John's baptism. But the Bible doesn't actually give us an example of that. In other words, we don't, there's nowhere where it describes the baptism of one of the apostles, you know, uh, John's baptism. And there's nowhere where there's a command that says to the apostles, you need to have John's baptism. So we don't have an example, we don't have a command. But here's what we do have. All those who believed were commanded to do so at the time. I mean, even Jesus received the baptism of John. So the inference or the unstated conclusion is that, well, the apostles also received the baptism of John. You know, it's like a syllogism. You know? If everyone you know, uh, that followed John uh, received the baptism of John, and if even Jesus received the baptism of John, therefore we can assume that the disciples of Jesus also received the baptism of John, because many of them were, before becoming disciples of Jesus, were disciples of John. So there's the, uh, an idea of how a necessary inference works. So when it comes to the elders, there are other details about their work and relationship to the church that are discovered through this process of reasonable deduction. For example, <clears throat> we know that they served congregations in groups of at least two for each congregation. Uh, we learn that in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, not by a command, not by an example. You know, somebody says, all right, you two, you're going to be elders. What we see is that every reference to the selection of these leaders always sees them being chosen and serving as a group of at least two. Now, the practice of having one man as the pastor or the main minister, or the main elder of a congregation, and then another man with another title, like bishop or cardinal or something, that man is in charge of two or three churches or a certain number of churches in a certain area, and then there's a committee in charge of all the churches in that country or in that state, and then there, you know, and it keeps going up, that model is based, that organizational model, is based on the Roman Empire. That's how the Roman Empire was organized. And that uh, model, if you wish, began to creep into the church in the third or fourth century. Now, the New Testament church, the one that's described in the Bible, always had two or more elders leading an individual congregation and it had no further responsibility or authority for other congregations. In other words, the elders who were the elders um, in the church at uh, Ephesus were only the elders over Ephesus. They weren't elders over Philippi or the church at Jerusalem or the church at Antioch or the, uh, you see what I'm saying? If you're an elder and you're serving with other elders, two or more elders, your role is to be uh, an overseer or a shepherd of that particular congregation, that flock. But you are not an elder over the church. You know, like we have elders here in Choctaw. Our elders are our elders, but they're not the elders over the church at Ridgecrest in Midwest City or East Side or Memorial Road. So there is local autonomy of congregations. We learn about that in 
the New Testament, and local autonomous leadership for each of those congregations and a plurality of leadership. This is the conclusion we draw when we read about elders and their positions in the New Testament. So in other words, we, we infer or we conclude from the information provided that the New Testament church, A, had a plurality of elders and B, had, these elders had no authority beyond the local congregation. So any situation where you have one or a group of people in charge of several churches, this is not a biblical model. It may be a religious model, it may be a time-honored model, it may be a model that has you know, great tradition and lots of ritual and music and pomp and ceremony, but it's not a biblical model. The biblical model for the church is that individual congregations have individual uh, a plurality of leadership, period. The, the, the leadership doesn't go beyond the local congregation. Someone will say, well, well how are these, you know, now you've got you know, 10,000 churches of Christ uh, you know, in the United States, how, how do you organize them? Well, you don't organize them. They're 10,000 separate and autonomous congregations with their own leadership. Well, how do we get anything done? Well, the, the reason we get anything done, the reason that there's consistency from one congregation to another is that everyone bases the organization and the management and the, you know, the, the way that their church operates based on the New Testament and nothing else. Not tradition, not somebody's book or anything like that, only the New Testament. So when people everywhere are just reading the New Testament, trying to figure out you know, how do we organize our church, they always come to the same you know, conclusion. Oh, you have more than one elder for church. Oh, the elders are not in charge of any other churches. It's local autonomous leadership. That's how we get there. Okay, another thing we learned from uh, you know, necessary inference is that um, they were uh, appointed by the apostles in certain instances and also uh, they were appointed by the uh, local preacher. In Acts chapter 14 verse 23, in Titus chapter 1 verse 5, we learn about this. Now, here, we don't see them doing it. You know, in Titus, for example, we don't see Titus actually doing it. But Paul says to Titus to raise up elders in, in, in each city, in each, congre in, in each congregation. So what is, our, you know, what is our necessary inference? What is our conclusion? Well, Titus was an evangelist. And Titus was told by an apostle to go ahead and raise up elders in different congregations. In other words, to raise them up, meaning to, to select and train and you know, raise them up in maturity and, and work and understanding and knowledge. You know. That was his work, raise up leadership in the different congregations. So we can conclude from that that evangelists can appoint and raise up elders in different congregations. And the way that it normally works is that congregations that have no elders young churches, mission churches, so on and so forth, but they do have a preacher, you know, a missionary, an evangelist, well then the role of, of, of raising up elders falls to him. That's his task. All right. Um, one thing we do know, there are no self-appointed elders. You know, nobody stands up and says, you know what, I feel like I'm going to become an elder. I think it's a good thing to do, so I'm appointing myself elders. That doesn't happen in the New Testament. And also, uh, selecting an elder by the majority, that also doesn't work. It's not a democratic process. Yes, you can get feedback from the church as to uh, how, how uh, qualified an individual is, and we do that all the time. But it's not a, uh, it's not a voting thing, you know, uh, so-and-so got 200 votes, so-and-so got 100 votes, okay, you know, candidate A wins. It's not a contest. You know, when we ask feedback from the congregation, we, we want them, we want the congregation to tell us, um, do the men that we are putting before you uh, as elders, do these individuals, uh, according to your knowledge of them, do they live up, do they measure up to the qualifications that elders should measure up to uh, based on the Bible? So we, 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 we were able to come to that uh, 
to that conclusion. So one of the other things, as I mentioned, that uh, we can uh, reasonably deduce from the scriptures is that these men are appointed to their task, either by the preacher, either by other elders. Okay, um, okay so that's uh, some of the work of the elders. Uh, we'll go a little more deeply into how they're uh, elected uh, next time, how they're chosen, how they're established uh, in the modern age. And we'll also end this section on elders with a profile of elders' wives, because the apostles also talk about elders' wives and some of the qualifications that they need to have uh, uh, to uh, support their husbands in this particular work. Okay, so that's our lesson for today. Uh, I pray that it's been a blessing to you and we'll see you next time for the continuation of this series, Elders, Deacons, Preachers, and Saints. <laughs>